Hello everyone and welcome hey. back to QFMC Conversations uh, where we're going to have a conversation centered around scripture. Today we are uh, looking at Matthew chapter 5, continuing the Sermon on the Mount. Um, this sermon was uh, spoken by Jesus to his disciples and a, and a crowd. And so, excuse me, uh, we're going to keep looking at starting at verse 17 and uh, read on in there. Just a quick reminder, this is not meant to be... Um, teaching primarily. This is meant to uh, just provoke a discussion. So we invite you to leave a comment below, join the discussion, the conversation with us that we're going to have. If you have thoughts or if we said something that was off or wrong, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, ahead of uh, reading the scripture and diving in, I want to pray for us. And then Nate's going to read the scripture for us. So would you pray with us? God, uh, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for uh, all the things that are in it, the, the things that we can learn about you and about ourselves and about the world. And Jesus, thank you for the Sermon on the Mount that you, that you spoke and, and for the disciples who wrote it down. And I thank you for the way that it flips, flips the world upside down and causes us to think in new and different ways. And so, Holy Spirit, as we read, would you uh, prompt in us new thoughts and uh, old thoughts that we've forgotten and things that we can do to be changed for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of Jesus' name. And we pray in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we're like I said, we're still in Matthew chapter 5, like it says up in the corner over there. Up in the corner. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's up there somewhere, right, yeah. Nate? Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyways, Starting all right. Matthew 5, verse 17, the fulfillment yeah. of the law. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called greatest in the king will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that was through verse twenty. Yeah. So we'll stop right there. If we have time, we can keep going. Okay. So. So this is, this is an interesting portion, right? Um, so there's a, a huge debate between among Christians that talks about uh, like faith do, versus acts. Well, no, not that, but the the idea of like, okay, well, Jesus fulfilled the law <laughs> of the Old Testament, and so we're not under that umbrella, and we don't have to keep it. We don't have to worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. Some some Christians take it so far as to say that the Old Testament no longer matters. Um, I don't I don't hold to that. I don't think that's yeah. that's true. Um, but Jesus, well, he 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 quite literally calls it out. Like, not the least stroke of a pen will will disappear. Right. So like, so it's like the it, punctuation still matters. <laughs> right. That's that's fair. Yes. So the interesting thing is. Um, like as you were reading something that stood out to me um, verse 19 anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven so okay so the the law still matters right yes. that's what Jesus the law said still matters. still matters he didn't come to just the blow it up it. Yeah. abolish it but it, people who don't follow the letter of the law to a T will still be in the kingdom of heaven just the least right but but do you catch that though anyone like, who breaks one of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven so may, so maybe maybe i'm reading too much into this but is jesus like um subtly taking a jab at legalism Possibly, um, you know what I'm saying. Like, so I guess here's my question. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who breaks one of these is, is uh, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Is that synonymous with damnation, or is that just like 
a second-class heaven citizen. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting into like yeah. <laughs> now you're getting into some like Catholic theology. Um, well, not, not that I think there's such a thing as a second-class right, heaven citizen. Like yeah, I man that I don't know. I just I just found that I, that struck me really interestingly when you read that the fact that like okay Jesus just said I didn't come to abolish the law it, it still it still matters right yeah I came to fulfill it it still matters don't get rid of it and then he says but if there are people that that don't keep all of the laws like they'll still get in but they will be the least I will say this my right? uh, my study notes here says uh, uh, verses 18 through 20 Jesus is not speaking about against observing all the requirements of the law but against hypocritical uh, f what, uh, Pharisee Pharise Pharisaical legalism so <laughs> oh there you go so, so, so maybe I my assessment was Such right legalism was not the keeping of all details of the law, but a hollow sham of keeping laws externally to gain merit before God, while breaking them inwardly. Ah. Okay, so that would make sense because a lot of uh, what Jesus is about to go into, talking about murder, adultery, divorce, all mm -hmm. these things, he's, he's taking the things that we think of as outward things and making them yes. eternal, right? Yes, he's saying like, the letter is there to teach you what the spirit of the law is. If you're only keeping the letter of the law, you're not keeping the law because you're, you're not doing it for the right reasons. You're not following... Well, it's the same problem that all laws have, whether it's governmental laws or anything else, is that it no, no codified law can cover every possible situation. Mm-hmm. And so that's what that's the point of differentiating between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is you don't go over 60 miles an hour on this road because da, da, da. Oh, well not because you don't go over 60 miles an hour on this road full stop. And then the spirit of the law is this law is there to keep people safe and to keep things fair and, and that's what the what the purpose of that law is to keep people safe. And so if you're going 60 but it's still not keeping if, – if you're endangering other people, you're still breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So – okay, so back to what Jesus is saying, though. It's like is setting aside one of these commands, like one of part of the law, is he saying that you're, you're – you're breaking like you're 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 not holding to the letter of the law but you're following the spirit or like what are you getting at there when you when you're talking well about, I, I was talking about spirit? that in the sense that in, in the same way the bible can't cover every situation that's going to happen in human history and so we right. have to some we, we have to be intentional and read into and not just say hey i did abc and now i'm a good person because guys can say no ABC is there to show you or, or to, to, to get you in the right ballpark of what being a good person is. If you're just mm. doing ABC because I said ABC, then that's, as you said, legalism and, and it's just following the rules of the game because you have to and not because you're actually playing the game to have fun or uh, you're, you're playing the game to win, not playing the game to, ha to enjoy the game. I see. Right, so the law was given not to um, the the law was given not to just simply put constraints on the people of Israel. The law was given to the people of Israel so that they could fully enjoy God, even though they were sinful and apart from God. Right, the the law existed so that they could have a right relationship with God here on earth. And, and it yes. wasn't perfect, but that was the spirit of the law. That's yeah. why they had it, right? That's why there's so many, so many different little intricate pieces of the law that talk about cleanliness and unclean and, and all these different things because, because God is a holy, clean God 
and we are sinful, unclean humans, mm -hmm. right? That's why animal sacrifice was a thing, and that's why there was rituals like, you know, if you touch blood, you know, go get yeah. yourself clean, yeah, right? You have to leave the camp There's for like, three days, or right? There's all these sorts of things, and some of the spirit of that is like, well. There's a, there's a cleanliness factor between you and God. There's a cleanliness factor between you and other human beings, yes. right? And the spirit of the law was, so, was for human beings to enjoy communion with God and communion with themselves, right? Not, not just to put constraints and shackles onto, um, onto humans, but that's what ended up happening, right? That well, the, the letter of the law became so much of so much of what was important to the Pharisees, especially yes. right. Just like Jesus alludes to, like y your righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisee and the teachers of the law, right? They created other laws just to keep in in standing with the laws that they had, right? Yeah, like they were so it was so legalistic. It and, was well, and, and so once again, that's. I really don't like this metaphor that I've started, but they're they're following the rules of the game to win, not not to not to have fun in the game. I don't. I'm, let me say why I don't like that metaphor is because applying it to life, the point of life is not to have fun. Right. The point of life is to draw closer to God. Right. Um, to to become a better person by drawing near to God, by drawing near to God. Becoming a better per like, like that that is well we were created potato, potato we were created to enjoy relationship with God yes like, that's why we were created right to enjoy a loving relationship with God and with other human beings that's that's my best understanding of why we God created us yeah. right out of love he created yes. so we could love ourselves so we could enjoy God's love so we could also love him in return. Right, sin is is not choosing to love God. It's choosing to not follow God, and and so the law made a way for human beings to could work their way towards a, a right relationship with God, and they couldn't do it. Right, that's why the the law can, can wasn't. I, can I jump in and and maybe change that language a little bit? Okay. Not necessarily to work their way to God, because I think. That language in particular is what a lot of the world struggles with is this idea of a ledger and you have to more positive points in the ledger than the negative points, right? Is, is that the idea that you earn your way to heaven? Sure. Um, it's not about the... It's not about working your way to God. It's the law was put in place so that you... So we could understand what the boundaries and what the nuances of the relationship are. Right when when you get married, you go through marriage counseling and you talk to your wife and you guys even after married you work out like what are the nuances? What are the the tug and, and pull and, and push and pull of this relationship? Mm -hmm. Right, and so God's saying like, hey, this is how a relationship between creator and creation. This is how it works. Right. Yeah. Well, and so. And he, yeah, and the the law, it, it was necessary because uh, human beings were so lost, mm -hmm. right? Literally Well, it was lost. necessary because without law, it's anarchy. Yeah, right. Well, and um, the other thing that, like, the law just gives us an insight also into God's heart and the fact that he is, um, he is... He is a god of order and not chaos, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, how we come to God also matters, right? Um, but okay, so we're talking a lot about the law, spirit of the law. But yeah, what about this idea that um, Jesus fulfilling the law, right? He didn't come to abolish it, but he came to fulfill it. And the, there's a lot of idea about what exactly that means, means and what Jesus meant, right? Like, it meant it, to me, it would mean that if you went back into the Old Testament, you would find it incomplete in the sense that it, it needs fulfilling, in the sense that the Old Testament, which it does, acknowledges that there is more to come. Right. Right? The, the acknowledgement being that 
we are fallen in the eyes of God and that we can't recover by our own power. And if that is the full full story, if we stop right there, then our case is hopeless. Right. But that's not the full story. We, we, we the, the Israelites knew that the Old Testament wasn't sufficient, and, and Jewish people today are still waiting for the Savior to come. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. But, but that's <laughs> the point, is that the Old Testament, it, uh, an intricate, uh, intricate a, a key point of the Old Testament is the idea of a Messiah. Yeah. That's true. Right? Well, and, okay, so Jesus, because Jesus doesn't just say the law, right? We're forgetting the other part that Jesus says. Yeah, law and He the says prophets. law um, and prophets, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, right? The prophets talked more than the law did about about a Messiah, yes. about one who would come to right every wrong, to wipe every tear, to to make a, a right relationship, to bring people back in communion with God, right? So, and that makes more sense than the than the law piece, right? Because Jesus fits into the prophecies really like a glove. He does, right? But when we talk about the law and like what is what is what does it mean for Jesus to fulfill the law, right? Some people, I, and I've heard some people talk suggest like, um, like I said, Jesus fulfilling the law is meaning he's. He is um, abolishing uh, the law. Yeah, he's which take, is what he says he's not doing. Right, he, the, like they don't use that strong of language, but, but that's the implication. That's what the implication is that it no longer matters. Right, yeah. it's like well, clearly it matters. Jesus <laughs> references the Old Testament a lot. Well, and if Jesus came to not abolish the law, but to make the law not matter, which is the same thing, then why does Jesus keep the law to a T essentially? Because right. right, right, wasn't he perfect? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, but there's also interesting nuances because within the law, there are there are um, there's a lot of talk about how you have to sacrifice such and such animals for different sins. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesus is the 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 unblemished lamb mm-hmm. who is the the sacrifice, the all sufficient sacrifice, right? Yes, right. So. In a way, oh, like, me. there's a part of the law that seems to be abolished because we don't do animal sacrifice anymore because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, right? So, well, so it's like, the, the, I guess for me and for others, th- there's a little bit of confusion there, right? Because there's, there's obviously nuance, and I haven't studied this in depth or read a ton of commentary about it. Um, well, but, I would say... If but I you get what I'm really saying? Quick. I do, I do, but to me, I didn't see a confusion there because to me that is the distinction between he fulfilled that law, he didn't abolish the need, well, he abolished the need for sacrifice mm-hmm. by, by being the fulfillment, uh, by being the perfect sacrifice. Right. Um, so I suppose then you could extrapolate a theoretical con- condition where if humanity could have manufactured a perfect sacrifice we wouldn't have needed <laughs> Jesus but we couldn't have done that no so um, I don't think that is abolishing it because wh- why do you make why did they make animal sacrifices in response to when they had sinned right mm-hmm. all right and so now the idea is we have still sinned but we don't have to make that sacrifice because the sacrifice, it, to me, it comes back to that idea of, of a ledger. Like here, here, you, you did your, your your negative point. You you took out ten dollars. So now we got to go and put ten dollars back in. And Jesus came up to the bank and put in infinity dollars. <laughs> All right. So he, he didn't abolish it in the sense that 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 part of the law no longer matters. If we didn't have infinity dollars in the bank, we would still have to be able to put those ten dollars back in. But mm-hmm. he came and said. I, I I've covered I, I've covered your bankroll, all right. From here on out, you don't. Yeah. It's not that it doesn't. It's not that he abolished it in the sense like, hey, we're just gonna ignore that law. It's that it's not applicable. It's not applicable anymore. Right. Which is something I never thought of. Why don't modern day Jewish people make animal sacrifices? Well, it's kind of illegal, I believe. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've never thought about that before. I don't know. I don't know if there's any Jewish people watching this, Probably but if there not. are. If there are. If there are. Uh, let so, us now let me throw a question at you, because I thought, I think about this when I read this before. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He didn't come to abolish the law. He, he says, uh, not the least stroke of a pen, not the smallest letter will disappear. So... What's your take on all the old laws about eating restrictions that Christians don't really observe anymore? Some still do, but by and large. Literally, I was thinking about this because uh, I, uh, I read a... Part of it is that later on, he, he verbatim abolished. <laughs> he says, like, it's not what goes comes out of your mouth. It's what go, or uh, I got it backwards. It's not what comes goes into your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out. Right. Again, it's a it's a heart issue, right? Yes. And so, if you recall, I believe in Acts, Peter has this vision. Um. Um. I think three times, uh, where a blanket full of unclean things, yeah, are coming, and and he sees, I believe, Jesus say, "Get up, take and eat," mm-hmm. and and Peter has this back and forth as Peter often does. Um, and says, "Poor guy, it's really hard to argue with Jesus." It, it is, right? <laughs> but Peter says, uh, "No, Lord, I will never, I will never defile myself or something yeah. along those lines of with this unclean food." And Jesus rebukes him and says, "Hey, don't call what something unclean that I have said is clean. Mm-hmm. Get up and eat." Right now, there's something to be said because. Uh, <sighs> Is that is he literally talking about food? Because there's implication that it's not actually about food. It has nothing to do with food, in fact, and it has everything to do with the fact that Jesus is alluding to the fact that the message of the gospel is for Gentiles, right? <laughs> that that well, previously see- Jewish people saw uh, it was it was us versus them, right? Yes, it's Jews versus the rest of the world, the rest of the world Gentiles. Yeah. And they were unclean, right? And so this idea of cleanliness and unclean and unclean, and I get that. But but the message of the of the gospel has reached Gentiles before that point, mm-hmm. and Peter didn't really make a stink about it. Yeah. So was it? Well, but it, there's also there's also an issue of like was this a just meant more for him on a personal level, or was this something that was widespread, right? So. I don't know. I don't know about that, right? Because obviously Jewish people don't eat pork. Yeah. Right. Yep. They, they and, still observe the. Um. You know, I kosher. I ate called. pork this morning. Yeah. Bacon. Uh, well, <laughs> sausage. But, I I ate bacon. Yeah. Okay. I ate bacon this morning. So, okay. Did we we just abolished part of the law? Did we do that? Like so. so again, it comes down to. The, the spirit of the law, right? So what was the <laughs> spirit of the old laws? So, and now we are having to read... The problem with looking for the spirit and not the letter is the spirit isn't written down literally. That That is the difference. Is you are having to read into into the text. And this is where either you can get on a slippery slope, and I don't want to get into too much. <laughs> but I know um, I, I've heard that, you know, often... There's a lot of concern with um, with pork, uh, just from a health standpoint, yes. right? Yes. From from pork had a lot of disease yes. and had a lot of um, issues, and people would just get sick, yes. right? From pork, it wasn't as as a clean of an animal either. the The way that they were taken care of wasn't great, mm-hmm. and so it was like there. There are some laws in the Old Testament that it seems as though God was just like, look, you you could probably do this, but it's just a better idea if you don't. Yeah. Just it, don't. Not not necessarily a, ooh, a a moral law and you can no, there, there are the- there are there are just there are simply some practical laws. Yeah. Um like do you think mixing uh the threads like, because oh, it says it there's does. a law. No, no, Don't no, weave mix, we- weave together different types of threads. Now, all our that, clothes, does that all have, our clothes are made that way nowadays? Right? Does that have? Does that? 
you mean to tell me there are something moral or ethical behind that? that does, or is it simply a practical law does that, that I don't understand? Nature? Something I right? thought was fascinating when I found this out is now that we are 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years removed from when these books were written, um, it's really nice to uh, be vindicated in certain things, right? <laughs> to be able to point and say, I told you so. Um, I read this article, this was a couple years back, that, that talked about uh, circumcision. They, they did a bunch of studies and discovered that the, the best time to, do, to administer circumcision is, I forget what, what day it is, but it's like eight. Day, day eight. Yep. And they discovered that that's the, the best time. If you do it before that, you're likely to get an infection. If you do it after that, you're likely to, to grow. It grows, it heals wrong. Right. Day eight is perfect. And it's like, here we are, 4,000 years in all of our glorious civilization and technology, right? And it's like, hey, they were, you guys were right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that, that's it. That is a good one. That was a, like, that was a very like the the idea of circumcision set the people apart, right? Yes. It was, a, it was a distinguishing factor. But when it happened, the reason God said eight day on the eight day mm -hmm. eighth day circumcise the males is because biologically that's the best time to yep. do it. Yeah. Like, but but like we can assume that they didn't necessarily know that yeah right because of science and like they didn't have all, all the the they modern have technology our yeah and so god just told them for practical reasons yeah circumcise on the eighth day do now because right? obeying is a good thing it right gives you one it's more like, thing to practice obedience right and so yeah i don't know it's there i feel like there's so many things and the 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 in, uh, we're focusing more on the law than we are the prophets but like I said well, I feel like Jesus fits fit, the fulfillment of Jesus in the prophets makes more sense because like it, it's, well, it's more of a one call, to one yeah the prophets right? call out uh, uh, both a need for and pro they, they prophesy the right. coming of a messiah right And but with the law it's like there's so many things and so I and I've heard some people some people get really loose fast and loose about it and they're just like well you know hold fast to the things that you feel convicted about right because mm -hmm. the the role of the Holy Spirit which is something that the Old Testament people didn't have yes the role of the Holy Spirit is to guide our hearts to convict us and to correct us right that's yes. kind of those, those are a couple of things that the Holy Spirit does well, if we are doing something um, that that we just feel unsettled about, that might be the Holy Spirit convicting us to stop doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And there might be some things, and and this is where it gets like as evangelicals, even we we can get uh, we can get fast and loose about some of these things, and it, it bothers some people, and other people are okay with it, and like. And, and I don't even know where I land on it, right? Because when I hear Jesus' words, it's like he came to fulfill the law. I don't exactly even know what that all means. I feel like it's super nuanced and it's very specific. And it would probably take a lot more study and time and effort and thoughtfulness and prayer to understand what that fully means. Much more so well, than what we're going to get into in the next couple minutes yeah, before we close. Yeah. But and, and we've been you know focusing what I mean? more on the law. I was going to say I, we've been focusing more on the law because I know what the law says better than I know what the prophets say. <laughs> All right, the pro you need to read first the prophets, off, right? well, well, not just that. I, I read the prophets, but it's the difference between understanding the law sure. versus understanding. Yeah, well, I've yeah. read the prophets. Don't know what they're saying half the time, but I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> read it. Yeah, the, to read the prophetic books. Context is so key, Whoa. and if you don't yeah. get the context, then you'll get lost really quickly and just like end up frustrated because you're like, I don't, and then and then you'll end up picking out verses like Jeremiah twenty nine eleven and saying that it has to do with like you know graduating from high school and doing great on tests and uh, other things like that. Yeah, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven has nothing to do with doing well in sports or in school. We're getting a good job. Just going to say that. I'm going to get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Anyways. I don't even know what it says off the top of my head. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Yes. Plans to prosper you. Yes. And uh, not to harm you, to give you a hope in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't uh, know if I said it verbatim, 
but uh, that's the gist. But, but we know the scripture. That's I didn't the know the, the address off the top of my head. Yeah. That for, yeah. yeah. Anyways, so um, that's a good point. But also the law, like, um, we, we like to deal with, with most humans, especially in Western culture, like to deal with laws because it's black and white. Right. And, yes. and, but, but when Jesus talks about fulfilling the law, it, it doesn't seem so black and white because it's like, we are, you know, like you said, two, three, 4,000 years removed mm-hmm. from the law and, and, and where it all originated from. Right. Our society is vastly different. Mm-hmm miles millions of miles different than than the where the law was given to right and that's where i think that like what you're getting at with the whole spirit of the law and also what does the law teach us about god right mm-hmm. what does it teach us about god and about ourselves because we can still glean some of that from the law as we read it as we understand right because there are some things in the law that are just simply practical. Some things deal with moral things. Some things deal with ethical things. So and I guess, okay, I do want to touch on this. You were saying that you don't quite get how Jesus fulfills the law. Is, is, that, is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth. That, that's what I think you're... it's about what I said. I, yeah. What I mean so, by that is as a, as a whole, like how does that... How does that practically work out for us? So Jesus right? saying that implies to me that the law by itself is, is insufficient. That the law itself has holes. The law itself has is incomplete. And so then I would say, well, logically, what you would want to do is check is test that and go back and look at the law. And do you can you find any holes? Can you find that? Do you find that it's, the law is incomplete? Well, yeah, it's incomplete mainly with the idea of animal sacrifice, right? Because you had to keep sacrificing yeah. because the sacrifice was insufficient. Yeah. Right? Like you said, it, we owed $10, so we put in $10 because yeah. that's all we had. But with Jesus, it was like, you know, we owe a billion dollars, and Jesus says, yeah, well, my bank's limitless. So, so. to me, not – to me, it, 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 it's almost – how do I say – I won't say unimportant, but it, it it doesn't really depend on what the details are. Whatever the holes are, whatever the incompleteness is that that, that you find in the law, Jesus came ah. to to fulfill those holes. Yeah. To 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 connect all the dots. We only sure. have some of the dots connected. He came to give us the complete picture. Mm. That's good. It still doesn't kind of a, a test, or that still doesn't give. Um, satisfaction to the latter half that we read the fact that none yeah. of the law will go away and that if you don't keep all of it if you if you say hey i'm gonna get rid of this part you're gonna be least mm-hmm. in the kingdom of heaven but if you keep all of it but you have to do be better at keeping all of it than the pharisees and the teachers of the law i still don't know what then that you'll means. be right like all of that that's but what we, i'm well, that's at what least I'm getting. in the kingdom of heaven again does that mean damnation or does that mean because I, I've always thought to myself, you're like, I don't deserve, I, I don't deserve to go to heaven. No, nice. I, I can attest to that. And so, knowing that, if if my Jesus ticket gets me into heaven and, and I get to spend eternity sitting on the the front door steps, I don't ever actually get to go into the party. I just get to sit outside. I'm happy with that. It's better than the alternative, <laughs> right? Would you would you want to live in heaven as a second class citizen or rule hell? I, right to quote, yeah. um, who wrote Paradise Lost? I don't know. I don't uh, know. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. Anyways, well, we're we're already over the time that we would uh, like to take. So, uh, give us your thoughts. I feel like this of all of the conversations we've had, this one I feel like I have more questions leaving uh, than I did Go at the, going in. And maybe you have questions. Maybe you have some thoughts about, uh, well, I think the next couple, the whole sections, yeah. like the next whole chapter is, this is kind of a preface for how to go into the, the rest of the chapter. Right. 
Like, yeah, it's like Jesus is kind of setting himself up mm-hmm. for what he's about to talk about. So it'll be interesting the next yeah. conversations we have next week. So thanks for joining us and listening in. Uh, leave a comment below if you've got some thoughts about this or uh, let us know what you think about what it means for Jesus to fulfill the law. And the um, prophets. And the prophets, yeah. And how does that work out? practically for us i don't know what does it mean to be least in the kingdom of heaven yeah these are all interesting questions interesting thoughts to entertain um but hey we uh miss you guys uh, yeah. thanks for joining us we'll see you next time bye